Okay, so welcome everybody uh, to the YPN tonight. Um, pretty glad everybody could come and have us in the new fireside chat format that we've put together for this evening. Um, we're very happy to welcome Ronan Tynan here. Um, Ronan is a member of the IAA here and is a contributor to a lot of our discussions and debates here at the Institute, so he's a good friend of the Institute and we're delighted. Um, when we heard the release of his uh, great King Hank film, Syria, the Impossible Revolution came out of us. Uh, we're really keen to get him involved in the minute talk. Um, as I was talking to Ronan, hopefully the discussion won't be so much about filmmaking techniques, but we were really hoping to get a kind of discussion about the, the types of you know things Ronan has picked up since um, from making the film about the conflict itself. And obviously it's an incredibly complex issue that I'm sure everybody here has some understanding of, but every new perspective that you get kind of gives you a new uh, way of looking at it. So really looking forward to hearing about it today. Um, Ronan's film company Esperanza um, has been up and running for a while and this is one of the you know, really significant movies that's been released in a while so it's really good time to have it. So um, I'll turn it over to you uh, Ronan. You have a clip, but I don't know if you want to show it first or if you want to talk about it. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe I would just talk a bit first yeah. and then I can just show the clip. Uh, uh, first of all I want to thank you all for coming. I really do appreciate it because uh, I avail of every opportunity to talk about Syria. For, uh, not just, of course, you might say he won't say that only, you know, trying to sell the film and all that. <laughs> Which, of course, is true. But actually, uh, unfortunately, the democratic revolution in Syria has lost the narrative of war. And I'll be honest, uh, as someone who sees himself, but I do believe everybody should be a human rights defender, and I consider myself to be an aspiring human rights defender, and have been throughout my filmmaking career, as every single film I've made. Even unintentionally, it seems to have been on those kind of themes and issues, you know, about rights and people risking their lives for other people's rights and so forth. Uh, I felt compelled to make this film. But the credit for making it, though, uh, really should probably go more than 50% to Anne Daly, who was extremely tenacious in uh, pursuing it, especially on the research side, because it was, it turned into a leviathan of a project. Uh, because uh, the search for archive and so forth, but I don't want to get off my central point, which is this narrative war, which is sad, primarily because of the Russians to a great extent in their particular expertise in the electronic, on the electronic frontier, have managed to convince far too many people that this was, is, believe it or not, something so believe was about a sad fighting ISIS. Uh, and I remember in uh, Jane's Defence Weekly in London discovering that in 2014, only 4% 4% of Assad's military assaults were actually directed against ISIS. The only people fighting ISIS at that stage, in fact the first people to really take on ISIS in Syria, well of, well were of course the democratic revolutionary forces. So just to get back a little to where all this started for me, because I do think you might find it interesting, my first engagement with Syria occurred in Ireland in 2012 when I helped some Syrian friends make a presentation to the Dáil Foreign Affairs Committee. At that time, only, only in American Commons, 20,000 Syrians had been killed. At this stage, as you're probably well aware, more than 500,000 people have died in Syria. Half the population, as you're also probably aware, have been forced to flee their homes. Over 6 million are internally displaced, are internally dis uh, displaced. And about, uh, there's more than 5 million Syrians, refugees in other countries. In other words, it is uh, an absolutely human catastrophe of mega proportions. But even more seriously, Syria has not only become a major humanitarian crisis, it has also completely destabilized the Middle East. It has amplified uh, an existing dynamic, if you like, the famous Shia Sunni civil war, as it's called, which of course is very big to do with religion as initiation. It really reflects. Saudi Iranian competition in the Middle East, and Syria represents a huge Iranian victory, with the Iranians making up 80% of Assad's forces through Hezbollah, which is obviously heavily subsidized, various Shia militia, which is brought in from Afghanistan, Iran itself, Iraq, and elsewhere, and of course, its own Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, and of course, the notorious Quds Force, which is really its foreign military. Uh, adventurous element, if you like. And indeed, Syria, uh, Iran's influence in Syria has been very fundamental from the very beginning because there were Iranian military advisors in Syria 
from the get-go. And even today, when the uh, Syrian military force, the, the indigenous force, so depleted, you are more likely to find Iranian officers giving orders to Syrian conscripts. So it's a kind of a, a relationship between Iran, and I don't want to sound like a, a Trumper here now, so I'm advocating this hard right line to the United States. <laughs> I defy anyone. Uh, these are factual research points that we have come across. So that's the background. Uh, a very close relationship with Iran and Syria to begin with. In 2011, there was a democratic uprising. In 2011, the Arab Spring, as you're all aware, was in flames across the region. But nobody who knew Syria and all the Syrian experts we consulted were unanimous, given this mammoth research project, but this documentary, more like a PhD thesis, concluded they were very surprised that people took to the streets in Syria in 2011. Why? Because the country was very much known as a kingdom of silence. The Assad regime, Assad's father obviously built this up very effectively, a police state with a huge reputation for effectiveness very cleverly structured with competing intelligence services as well to maximize its effectiveness and almost insulate the regime from any kind of internal coup. So people knew very clearly from what had happened previously during the Muslim Brotherhood uprising in the early 1980s that if you took to the streets in Syria, you would die. If you didn't die, you would be arrested, you would be tortured, you could spend a very long time in prison. And again, I would content, challenge anyone to, to, uh, you know, to uh, rebut that. And it was quite, uh, really, very difficult to make this film meeting people who experienced that, you know, going to the street day after day, being shot at, seeing their friends shot, their family shot, and what happened in response to that violence, I mean, the revolution in Syria really is a response to that level of violence. And that was what I find fascinating. That really, it was a response to the violence. Because the initial chants of the people were about, you know, freedom, you know. They really wanted to have one country, there wasn't even talk of regime change. Within two weeks, however, a people gone down the street, it had completely switched away, and people were firmly in favour of regime change at that point as it began to evolve and it deepened. Um, it's something I think, why I'm so keen to get people to watch this film at this stage is because if you do not know the modern history of Syria, you're basically a prisoner of the last news story. You see something about terrorism in the newspaper and they say, oh, well, that's just these crazy terrorists in Syria and they're fighting this government, which may be a bad government, but better the devil you know than the devil you don't know, when in reality, of course, the Assad regime is almost like a, a, a huge complex for manufacturing jihadis in the sense of creating dissatisfaction and disaffection. But the point that I really want to get across if I succeed at all this evening is to really share with you my reaction now, which it's really, I, I actually see Syria very much as a country with three sides of this conflict on the, at the ground level, apart from the overlay of international forces who have literally destroyed, have contributed to destroying the country. On the one hand, you have a very effective civilian killing machine in the form of the Assad regime, which is really now almost a skeleton of its former self. The bulk of it is made up substantially by Iranian forces, a coalition, if you like, of Iranian forces, with Russia providing the Air Force. Assad's army, so-called, is really fractured into a series of mafias and local militias. And indeed, it's almost a mirror image, but much stronger than the opposition military operations, which again are quite chaotic, fragmented, and relatively, you know, they're relatively poorly armed, like that. But in the middle, if you like, you have civilians. Many of those civilians, especially in operation, oper, uh, opposition areas, uh, are firm believers, well, those who took to the streets at the 2011, 
they never wanted to take up violence of any description because they knew, as we were told many times, that if this turned violent, they would lose. And sure enough, that's what actually happened. Because the Assad regime, being such you know, a military dictatorship essentially, but also with the ability to maneuver foreign forces, in, you know, to literally do anything. Because in a sense, the Assad regime now is a, a, a de facto puppet. Could Assad dictate to the Iranians to go home? No. Would Assad dictate to the Iranians to go home? No. <laughs> because obviously, his survival now is intrinsically linked with that occupation. Uh, similarly with the Russians, it's almost amusing as well at the moment when you see the Russians claiming a victory in Syria, but the real winners, as we know from experience in all wars, are those who win on the ground. You know they say you can go so far with bombing, but if you don't bring people in on the ground, you can't sustain your victory in, 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 that, in that context. But I don't want to go off the central point to get back to civilians and the people who have suffered so much for the crime of seeking democracy, freedom, and dignity that we take for granted. It really was and is heartbreaking. It is so, so depressing. As someone who, the first documentary documentary was in Rwanda, immediately after the genocide, the blood virtually still on the ground, to think that such mass slaughter could occur again, I know it's happened many times before, but without any real outrage here. You know, I mean, there has not been any outrage for Syria. I mean, there's a remarkable group in Ireland called the Irish Syrian Solidarity Movement. And I say remarkable in the international context because they really make an amazing impact. And they're just ordinary citizens who become very upset about what was going on. But the pain of those Syrians suffered as they were being killed, they actually thought that when we saw them being gunned down the street, they would come, we would come. And you'll see this in the documentary. They assumed we would do something about it. But we didn't do anything about it. Russia and China in the Security Council, they took any action. But what did the United States and the European Union do? Absolutely nothing. Even worse, Obama called for Assad to go. However, on the ground it was obvious to ambassadors, that was not a clever thing to do because clearly, it if you're not going to act, because in the Middle East, when an American president tells a leader to go, they assume he's going to go, and it sets off a chain reaction so that perhaps, and again, I'm talking generally now, and I do hope you watch the documentary, but just to, for convenience and just for illustrative purposes, naturally enough, if people thought the Americans were going to do something, they might take risks they wouldn't ordinarily do. Would they take up arms if Obama said that to nurture a process they thought they would be rescued and so forth? Perhaps you see the point I'm trying to make. And that set off a chain reaction that continued throughout as we saw people slowly but surely being forced in many instances to take up arms because the regime really, as was tradition in Syria, took no quarter. You were with them or against them. And one of the chants uh, when the peaceful revolution started uh, was the Assad regime thugs would scream, it's Assad or we burn the country down. And in fairness, that's exactly what they did. We would destroy the country. And you will, that will become very apparent when you see the documentary as well. But, you know, it really was, as far as they were concerned, always a zero sum game. I should also point out, this is also the first time I've spoken about Syria where I didn't have the advantage of showing this, the film first. Because it's remarkable the amount it lifts off your shoulders when you see the film. Then I can just sit back and answer questions, and it's much more relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to really get this across to you, if I can, that we're talking about real people like you and I. The Syrians I found are moderates in a very profound way, you know. Sure, like many people in the Middle East, you know, Many of them obviously are Muslims, but I do think it's also important to bear in mind again to counteract the Assad success in the, in the narrative war that when the uh, peaceful uprising started in 2011, the people who came out on the streets were not just Muslims. They were not just Sunni Muslims in large numbers. 
There were Christians, there were Druze, everyone was represented. And people we interviewed in the film, and I, we have already explained that they were shot down and so forth, but many were also apprehended, disappeared into sad prisons. And it is estimated that could be as many as 200,000 still, believe it or not, locked up. And you're aware of the torture and terrible treatment that was meted out to many of them. And I want to talk about Yassin al Hajj Saleh in particular in that regard. But, but, it, but it is very important uh, to bear in mind the price they have paid for that sacrifice. And as I say, what really frustrates me is that their struggle, which has been incredible, what a suffering they have actually, and are still endured, people just don't know about it. That because the regime and the Russians have won that narrative war, there's a complete lack of appreciation about the nature of the civil society that developed through the revolution. And when I mention three sides in the conflict, you even found that even in Aleppo, particularly in Aleppo, but right quite across opposition areas, that as the bombs were falling, you still had their democratic councils elected, you still had civic societies. Now, just, uh, which of course is much easier to show you in the documentary, which I hope you will all see eventually. The reason, if you like, the democratic nationalists, if you like, were defeated, was Obama, in my personal view, and this is where I'm kind of going to go off message here, and I'll comment about the Iran deal, which I was extremely enthusiastic about, would have become extremely disillusioned about. Because, of course, Obama, in my personal view, set the Iran deal ahead of Syria, which was a strategic mistake. Because it's my firm conviction now that the Iran deal was doomed anyway because of the disintegration of Syria. Because Syria has destabilized the region, and I would argue it has potentially destabilized the balance of power in the world. It is of world global significance. Uh, and that's something I think we, we, um, we, we, have to, we have to be very conscious about. And the genesis of Obama, if you like, leaving, you know, he leads the Syrian democratic forces up the garden path. And then in 2013, when the famous gas attack occurs in Ghouta, Obama red lines across the regions of the He creates a face-saving device to avoid having to take any action. But of course, it's just disingenuous to say that it's just his fault in the UK Parliament, I was in London at the time, uh, as well. And of course, in the UK Parliament, they voted not to intervene, not that they would have been really intervening very much, because the principal way civilians were being slaughtered was principal to air attacks, even by the regime at that stage, because they were using barrel bombs, which we also explore in the documentary. You see very clearly how these very crude weapons were very powerful weapons of terror. In other words, it would have been very easy to kind of compel the regime, in my view, to have some kind of negotiations at that stage, if effective action had been taken to knock out, even to knock out their, 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 uh, their air power, or as a minimum to create humanitarian zones, uh, no-fly zones, and so forth, um, at that stage. But of course, at this stage now, that's all sort of, uh, people would say with the advice of hindsight, we might say that, but those of us who lived through that, who monitored that throughout that period, saw opportunities missed constantly to create a peaceful settlement. Those of us who didn't want to see any kind to minimize, uh, to bring war to an end, you saw so many, a string of missed opportunities. But Obama's role in that is fascinating because he kind of completely, uh, you know, left those forces in the lurch. But again, in fairness to him, you know, the American people didn't have uh, enthusiasm for another war. But then people on the ground never wanted boots on the ground in Syria, ever. All they wanted was some a right, those who did take up arms, was a right to defend themselves in that context. Given that we wouldn't take effective action, which I would personally have favored, of heavily sanctioning uh, the Iranians who were already being sanctioned, but not sufficiently to bring this to an end. And also the Russians, when, even at that stage, before they directly and militarily intervened in 2015. Um, I, I do think, though, I, I really, you know, I. One of the reasons we actually made this film, and I even know as I try to uh, summarize this, that it can sound complex, but really it's not complex at all, really. Uh, it boils down to a simple, I think I'm going to just play the trailer now, and I just want to make a few comments afterwards. Because what it really boils down to is people who had suffered 
terribly under dictatorship for well up over 40 years, took to the streets at great cost themselves, they were gunned down. And they thought the world would come to their rescue because they peacefully uh, took that great risk. Uh, no one came. Worse still, uh, all that happened was the regime was strengthened by the Iranians who were constantly there. They saved the regime. Indeed, even demonstrations in Iran, thankfully at long last, but very belatedly, there are demonstrations in Iran today and they're getting much more, becoming much more public and more obvious because the Iranians have spent billions underwriting the Assad regime. They have lent the regime billions. I personally believe, and you can easily make a case for it, that the Iranian people have suffered far more to the regime's support for the Assad regime than they have through the sanctions regime. And that happened throughout that period. Now Obama, in my view, he gets the intel, he was getting the intel reports every morning. He knew this. That's why I personally think he bears a huge responsibility for what's happened in Syria. Whereas Putin in 2015 became directly involved in slaughtering Syrians. Uh, just to, not to go ahead too fast. I mean, the Iranians were there from the beginning. They already had military advice in 2011. But they started bringing in those militias and those forces. The turning point, or the dramatic increase in Iranian involvement occurred in 2013, when ISIS appeared for the first time, and Hezbollah, underwritten by Iran, were brought onto the battlefield. Now bear in mind though, the Iranians were still very strongly there, but they always preferred to keep their profile, or tried to keep their profile low. Uh, it became difficult, um, but ISIS made it a little easier, because when the as th thousands of Iranians were killed in Syria, but as they came home after ISIS, they were saying they were fighting terrorism, believe it or not, they, a country directly involved in terrorism, including uh, uh, the uh, Revolution Guard Corps and the Quds Force, using the battle of the narrative of the war on terror to justify its own very actions in Syria that could easily be defined as terrorism. It is a really funny word, not so tragic. So from 2013 on, they very significantly increased, increased their involvement in, in, in the country. Uh, no, as I said, I don't want to, I think just at this point, I think it will be useful just to a quick look at the, uh, at the documentary. So just want to, I don't want to miss that point about the Syrian people because Sometimes these discussions turn into geopolitical discussion, talk about militaries and all this kind of stuff, and we do kind of forget people and how exactly they are suffering in that context. And I really think it's, it's a pity. I can't allow that to happen, even I criticize it myself. The highest aim of the Assad dynasty is to stay in power forever. I met uh, repeatedly Assad father, Assad son, and I've never met such cold-blooded murderers. Naively, we thought that as soon as people know what is happening, they're all going to support us. Because who doesn't support people going to the street asking for freedom and not to be tortured and to be treated with dignity? People talk about it now as if the choice is between some kind of jihadist and Assad. And they think that Assad must be the better option because he shaves and he wears a tie and he has a nice pretty wife, whereas the other guy has a beard and a blood dripping knife. The alternative is not Assad or the terrorists. It's Assad versus the people. It's Assad versus democracy. Al-Assad can never win because Al-Assad cannot beat that soul, the revolutionary soul, inside everyone who went on the streets.
American artist Mark uh, Nelson was extremely valuable to us as well because um, although we went through thousands of hours of archive footage, some of the stuff is just so horrific you couldn't show it. And obviously it did allow us to deal with issues that, which was just fantastic we were making the film. The guy in the sweater I just want to talk to you about briefly, he's called, he's Yasin al Hajj Saleh. And one of the reasons this documentary became such a leviathan of a project was when we saw people like that who hadn't been initially covered, we said we had to feature him. I think to describe him in Syrian terms, he's probably a cross between Chomsky and Nelson Mandela. He spent 16 years and 14 days in prison under Assad's father. As he said, uh, he was a 19-year-old medical student in Aleppo. Uh, he was a member of a Communist Party. Like in Syria, there was an official Communist Party, which was probably the least part of another one. As he said, they were about in peaceful political activity. Not a drop of blood was shed. Not a penny was stolen by them. But because, as he said, they were disobedient. As he made the point very clearly, in Syria, you could be an Islamist, you could be a Marxist, to be anything, as long as you were obedient. The moment you step on the line, you will be tortured, you will be imprisoned, and you will pay a very high price like he did. He's a remarkable figure because in one person he sums up what's really happening in Syria and how the people who risk so much for democracy are really caught between the regime on one side and a kind of certain Jihadist elements, though by even in Aleppo, they were by no means the minority majority in Aleppo. You know, they were a minority of the, shall we say, the um, Al Qaeda based uh, element. But because in Aleppo, for example, it was a very much a uh, civil society dominant location. But for example, his wife was kidnapped by the jihadists in uh, Douma. She became actually one, one of the Douma four. And Razan Zaitouneh, who would be internationally renowned as a civic democratic activist in the opposition at the time, she was also kidnapped with two others, and they've never been heard from since. And his brother was murdered by ISIS in Raqqa. So it's a kind of, he uniquely and of course the regime put him in prison for 16 years. So you see, he suffers at the hands of the jihadis on one side, ISIS at another level, and at the hands of the and that's the high price people pay in their support for democracy. And it really almost breaks my heart again, and that's a rather pathetic way to say it, I admit, when I see demonstrations against certain jihadist elements in opposition areas, proving the depth and commitment that that democracy has really, uh, that has taken root. It just reminds me, and hopefully, when you see the documentary, you may share that view that um, something very fundamental has happened in Syria. There is that genuine commitment for a, a real commitment, a real desire for freedom, for dignity, and for social justice. But of course, at this stage, let's be truthful about it, it does appear that the opposition, from a military point of view, has of course been effectively crushed. And I just mentioned the failure of the West to support the nationalist opposition, if you like, which might be called the Free Syrian Army as such, uh, which was formed when the crackdown really began in Syria very early by def soldiers who, and officers who defected in the Syrian army because they refused to kill the people. That really was the, the backbone of the... Uh, but they didn't get any support. And the only people who did get support on the opposition side were jihadist elements. And this is a huge tragedy. The Saudis, the Qataris, and the Turks backed those groups. So you had this automatic imbalance in the opposition. And worse still, um, the United Nations in the delivery of aid. And this is something we didn't really go into very much in the documentary, but I'll be honest, we're working on something on it at the moment. The uh, way aid has been filleted by the regime in fact, it is one of the great scandals that is coming to light now that UN humanitarian aid, to which you as taxpayers, I as a taxpayer, help contribute to us, was fundamental in bankrolling the Assad regime. In fact, 
it's debatable whether that vital lifeline provided by the UN, because this was basically given to Assad, and they were supposed to even give that to areas under siege. But what they would do is they'd fill it. They didn't even send the aid to their own areas, such as the level of corruption amongst the regime. And Dr. Ali Sparrow, a renowned uh, humanitarian and pediatrician, who's done amazing work in Syria you know, on vaccination programs in opposite areas, even it, just in the last two weeks and before the thaw, gave profound and compelling testimony articulating this. And I just want to give the government a bit of a headache about this as well, too, because we're taking over some UN Coordination Committee on aid, and we will have an opportunity to exert some influence on that. And I certainly hope it's something the Institute might be interested in taking up as a research topic, because it is one area where um, our resources have been used to uh, funnel aid directly to the regime. And the way aid should be given is on the cross-border routes where gold and trokers and fittings have been involved. So our own agency seem to know the right way to try to distribute that aid rather than bankrolling the regime. Now I don't want to go off on a tangent, which of course, I, 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 because of the nature of this topic and because you haven't seen the documentary, I've been tempted to do a couple of times this evening, but I just want to get back to Yassine al Harish Sally, because he's written a book called The Impossible Revolution, Eureka. Now you know we're going to have time for documentaries. Uh, we filmed an interview with him in Turkey. Uh, we got on famously with him. Very uh, nice guy. Uh, when people call him a terrorist, as they regularly do, <laughs> uh, accusing him of being a Al Qaeda and so forth. I mean, you would never meet a more secular individual, let me tell you, but, uh, or a more, uh, you know, um, a person more committed to what we value as democracy. But uh, the sacrifices that he has personally made, he would, of course, assume that and really say, you know, he is, you know, he managed to escape from Syria in 2013 because they were looking for him, and if he had not escaped, I can assure you, he would be dead now. He would have been tortured to death without a shadow of doubt like many other leading opposition activists were. But in his person, he kind of embodies that spirit that's still very much there. And what I really want, I didn't want to sort of sit here tonight and say, if we had bombed Syria earlier, or if we had given the opposition military an area, everything would be grand. No, no, I don't want to leave that message with you. What I want to say is, and I really hope you do see the documentary, because if we had supported those people, risk their lives peacefully for democracy. If we refuse to sit idly by and say to the Assad regime, no, we will not tolerate you massacring people who at great personal risk took to the streets for the very things we take for granted. We will not tolerate that. 500,000 plus people would not be dead in Syria today. It's because the whole debate about the Middle East is framed in that geopolitical, militaristic, kind of frame that we end up where we are. And indeed, even the way politicians approach it, like Obama, Obama really would be, and I know some of you know a little about, well, maybe some of you may be far more expert in, expert in international relations than I am. Though I, I will say that I did, believe it or not, in London, uh, to prevent, prevent, prevent myself getting bored, I did actually do yet another master's degree in international relations at the University of Westminster which actually was a very useful thing to do at the time because I did actually pick, meet quite a lot of people as well, which was very useful while I was doing this documentary because I thought it might be an unfortunate distraction, but it actually proved to be very valuable. But the point about international relations, which Obama put down as one of the most ruthless wheels for a long time, who perhaps had the intellectual resources to appreciate what he was doing, but as I hope someday to meet with him, uh, to remind him that the huge risk he took in Syria was very silly because the very things the Iran deal is supposed to achieve, even if Trump and Trump hadn't taken it, was already forming. I don't know how many of you are aware, but the Houthis in Yemen actually fired a ballistic missile at Riyadh. A ballistic missile, this bunch of people who, in fairness, would not. Uh, be known for manufacturing ballistic missiles in the hills where they're from. Uh, in other words, the Iranians know how to make ballistic missiles. So the Sunni Shia civil war, really Saudi Iranian competition in the Middle East, 
had already reached a very serious pitch because of the grotesque scale of Iranian influence in Syria. And the Saudis showed their contempt for the Syrian people as well by only arming jihadis, who of course the Saudis have no interest whatsoever in democracy in Syria. And it explains the internationalization of that conflict in regional terms, but also in global terms, because it brings in the United States and it brings in the Russians, as we know, because of the Assad regime, in, in a profound way. And this is the other point before the Israelis really, because the Israelis and the Iranians are effectively at war in, city, in Syria now. You've seen the newspaper reports. My bigger fear, though, was there would be, or the potential still exists, though, very seriously, for a kind of a, a Saudi Iranian war, which actually would not take very long. It would be an air war, it would be over very quickly, but everybody in this room, and I emphasize that, and I think if you reflect on it, you probably will agree with me, will be economically very seriously affected. Affected because the first thing that's going to be destroyed on both sides are their oil production facilities. The Americans, of course, will come in on the side of the US and the Saudis, but before they get a chance, it would not take very much for the Iranians to block the channels by which the oil escapes from the Middle East to the usual commercial channels. In other words, what I'm saying to you is the Middle East is more volatile today than it's ever been, but all roads lead back to Syria. The failure of the West to stand up for Western values, and by that I mean the failure of you and I to stand with Syrian Democrats as individuals, as communities that they were being slaughtered, have left us far less secure today. And Trump sabotaging, sabotaging the Iran deal, while on the face of it looks like a um, shall we say, a reckless thing to do. And in fact, I'm a little nervous about it myself, I have to be honest. It may not prove to be the most disastrous of things because there is no way whatsoever, in spite of the uh, alleged opposition of the Gulf states to Israel, we're all well aware here, if we have any interest in trash race, about the alliance that was formed between the Saudis and the Israelis long before when Obama clearly showed that it, that it overbearing interest in this Iran deal, we're well aware of its implications in regional terms. Indeed, I've even seen stories from the Saudis to humor the Israelis, who were even involved in certain funding arrangements in the occupied territories, which I'm sure, of course, it could be just fake news, but anyway, the bottom line is that Saudi-Israeli relation is real and very intimate. It varies both sides, I suppose, want the other to take on the Iranians. <laughs> and at the moment, the Israelis have certainly obliged the Saudis. That's a frighteningly serious situation. The sabotaging of the Iran deal, in my view, potentially might, might cool the situation. But the truth is, the, the potential benefit, because I, at the moment, and I should really stop now because I know I have, I may appear to ramble, but it is a big picture subject and you know when you see the documentary a lot of the pieces will fit together but the reason that conflict with the Iranians is so serious is the risk of bringing in the Saudis uh, I would suggest that the sabotaging of the Iran deal by Trump makes that less likely for the time being because obviously it weakens the Iranians still further in terms of their economy from my point of view as somebody who initially was the Iranian get around here might appear to offer some hope, of course. But the truth is, the Iran deal offers the Iranians economic power, it offers them more economic energy, you know, more resources. And where are they going to deploy that? The Iranian economy is all bankrupt because of its massive involvement in Syria. And it's not because they like the Syrians. This gives the Saudis, if you look at the map, it gives the Iranians that famous Shia crescent. It gives them huge influence in the Middle East. There is Syria smack bang in the middle of the region, and the Iranians now effectively control it, except for Israeli inter. Not that I'm advocating, the Israelis are clear, but the Iranians are firmly entrenched now. And right across to the Lebanon, the meanwhile, of course, the Iranians continue recklessly in fairness uh, to engage in Yemen, where the Saudis are also shamefully engaged slaughtering civilians, Yemeni civilians. I mentioned the ballistic attack. Uh, from Yemen on the Saudi capital. So you see this resurgent Iranian power now, like it or not, in spite of its relative economic weakness, is the regional hegemon. 
which alarms the Saudis and the other Gulf states, in spite of the Qataris that have tiff with the Saudis, and we know the Israelis are not going to tolerate Iranian bases in Syria. Now we naturally, myself included, has, have a, has a, I have a big problem with the Israelis because of their, I call it apartheid occupation. I do alienate a lot of my Israeli friends by that. They always have robust discussions with me about that. But I think on any objective basis, they really have a case to answer the way they run that occupation. But the bottom line in geopolitical terms is Iranian bases in Syria it, 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 it's not just a provocation, it clearly destabilizes the region. And the reason I just I end my, my few words now by just making that observation, which I began with as well, about the potential threat to global stability. Because there you have a complex, a volatile situation now, which potentially affects us very seriously. I would not underestimate because if you consider most wars often start to miscalculation by accident and so forth in such a volatile region like the Middle East at the moment it's not inconceivable to see that regional war but ironically the so-called Iranian which is supposed to stop that happening has actually made it perhaps some argue made it closer now that it's been sabotaged there may yet be an opportunity for Syria because it deprives the Israeli and the Iranians of key resources. And I, I, I really must, as I, I thought I might get a chance to say it in a question and answer, in case I don't, I must talk about Idlib. Idlib is the last refuge for civilians in Syria, effectively. Every time sieges end, people are exported to Idlib. There's more than two and a half million civilians living in Idlib. More than half the population of other areas. These are civilians, families, who have been children have been bombed multiple times, they've fled multiple times from different areas, and now they're all in England. Um, Jean England, the Norwegian uh, humanitarian, I think he's chairman of the, he's still coordinating for the UN in, in, in various roles uh, and on the humanitarian side, has repeatedly warned about the risk of a catastrophe. I won't say that catastrophe is already starting because the Russians and the Assad regime are already bombing the situation in England is something that can be averted, it must be averted, but it's a continuation of what has happened in the rest of Syria. Because a sad strategy from the beginning, and I'm going to finish now, he called civilians terrorists when they went onto the street, he released jihadis from prison to try to poison that opposition, in fact many people who did release it as a successful strategy in some ways, as many of them ended up in leadership positions, positions in many of the jihadist groups, He's still calling them terrorists. He calls Idlib, basically, people in Idlib as terrorists. And you will notice, this is a very carefully uh, I I implemented strategy, uh, a scorched earth strategy, where the primary targets of all regime bombing raids and the Russians is always to target civilians. They bomb the hospitals, bakeries, schools, all civilian infrastructure, because the aim is always to move civilians on. It's always to get them out of opposition areas, to get them moving. That's why Italy is such a, a humanitarian catastrophe at the moment, because they've been moved so many times. And now we also see major engineering with Iranian Shias being brought into areas in Syria where Syrian Sunnis have been ejected. Again, it's the Assad regime, this tradition of exploiting sectarianism uh, to maneuver the country. But equally, we see the Iranians now very much engineering the creation of the new Syria to embed the regime very firmly and also obviously to regionally position itself. I repeat myself as the regional hegemon, uh, which is, of course, the most destabilizing thing imaginable from both the Saudis and the Israelis. Uh, and as I say, there is a silver lining potentially in the sabotage of the Iran deal, but I do think people who protest against that sabotaging, they write these letters about Iran as if it's some kind of democracy. When Iran has used so much of its resources for what amounts to imperialism, you know, imperial expansion in the region, it just beggars belief. I should stop there before I, um, just give you a chance to ask questions for the today. <laughs> I did kind of sweep across the canvas that is the region but uh, it, it's what makes it so fascinating, really. But the documentary just put what I said in context. Oh, thank you very much. That was very comprehensive.